Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the podcast. This is part three of my review of fractures for the ABR core exam. I have released a free downloadable study guide that you can download on my website, www.theradiologyreview.com. Now let's get back to the learning. What do we call bilateral calcaneal fractures? And the answer is a Casanova fracture. Here you are to envision someone leaping from a window and landing on the ground, breaking each calcaneus. And a next step on board exams, if you see Casanova fractures, which are bilateral calcaneal fractures, you should get plain films of the spine or some sort of spine imaging to look for compression and or burst fractures of the spine from axial loading. And again, the mechanism here is jumping from a height and landing feet first. So you have a lot of axial loading on the spine and you also have bilateral calcaneal fractures. Talking about the calcaneus, if Bowler's angle is less than 20 degrees, you should worry about what? And the answer simply is a calcaneal fracture, but you need to know what Bowler's angle is. You should know that it is associated with the calcaneus and that if the angle is under 20 degrees, that is a sign of a calcaneal fracture. And Bowler's angle is formed by a line drawn between the anterior and posterior borders of the calcaneus on the lateral view. Bowler's angle under 20 degrees is a sign of potential calcaneal fracture. Let's move on. What do you name a non-avulsed fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal? And this is also really key for board exams, in my opinion. So non-avulsed fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal, that is a Jones fracture. And you treat a Jones fracture with a cast and rest. Now, what if the base of the fifth metatarsal actually has an avulsion fracture? If the fracture extends to the articular surface of the fifth metatarsal, that is an avulsion fracture. If the fracture does not extend to the articular surface, it is a Jones fracture. And a classic history for a Jones fracture is an acute fifth metatarsal fracture in a dancer. And a Jones fracture looks like a transverse fracture at the base of the fifth metatarsal. And you need to know that a Jones fracture is prone to non-union, and about half of these may not heal completely, and these also take a long time to heal in comparison to an avulsion fracture. And if you end up with non-union, you may need to have internal fixation to address this. I would also know that fifth metatarsal stress fractures are difficult to heal and are high risk to progress to a complete fracture. Continuing down to the foot, what is the most common fracture associated with a Liz Frank injury? So think about that for a minute. The most common fracture associated with a Liz Frank injury. And the answer is a base of the second metatarsal fracture. And this is usually a small avulsion fracture and it is called the flex sign. And with this, you see a small fleck of bone in the widened space between the base of the first and second metatarsals. And that is the flex sign associated with a Liz Frank injury. And you will see that widened space between the base of the first and second metatarsals. What is the most common site of a stress fracture in young athletes? Think about this for a minute. And you may come to the conclusion that the most common site of a stress fracture in a young athlete is a tibial stress fracture. Tibial stress fractures are most common on the compressive side of the bone, which for the tibia is the posterior medial aspect. And that is why on a bone scan for stress fracture, you look for that uptake on the posterior medial tibia. If a stress fracture is located on the tensile side, which would be the mid-shaft of the anterior tibia, these have worse healing. You should know that compressive side stress fractures heal well because the bones are put in opposition, whereas tensile side stress fractures are difficult to heal because those bones are constantly being pulled slightly apart. And that is part of the reason why stress fractures 
in youth of the femur heal well because they tend to form on the compressive side, whereas stress fractures in the femur in older adults don't heal well because they are more common in the tensile side. Let's move on and talk about a classic clinical scenario that you can be presented with on a board exam question, and that is history typically of an older woman who develops sudden pain after arising from a seated position. Okay, so older woman arises from a seated position and develops sudden knee pain. And what they're getting at here is SONK, S-O-N-K, and that stands for spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. And this is actually a misnomer because the cause is an insufficiency fracture and not osteonecrosis. And the insufficiency fracture most commonly develops in the medial femoral condyle, which is the most weight-bearing portion. And in this case, you get this medial femoral condyle insufficiency fracture on one side, and there is no history of trauma but it is associated with a meniscal injury. And this SONC process, S-O-N-K, can happen in younger people after meniscal surgery, but most commonly on a board exam, they're going to give you the history of sudden pain after arising from sitting, and you'll see a radiograph, and you will see the insufficiency fracture of the medial femoral condyle, and you need to know that this is spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee, or SONC, S-O-N-K. So next question, runners that run on hard surfaces are prone to which location of stress fracture in the foot? And you can develop many stress fractures, but the one I am getting at here is the navicular stress fracture. Okay, you see this in runners that are commonly running long distances on hard surfaces. And a navicular fracture is somewhat analogous to a scaphoid fracture in that the navicular bone is at high risk of AVN if the fracture is displaced. So displaced navicular fractures are at high risk of avascular necrosis. And what do we call osteonecrosis of the navicular bone? There is a term for this. Navicular osteonecrosis is called what? And the answer is Kohler's disease, K-O-H-L-E-R, Kohler's disease. If you have multiple metatarsal stress fractures, a term for this is a March fracture, And you can think of military recruits marching all day. What is the most fractured tarsal bone? Okay, so tarsal bones in the feet, what is the most common fractured tarsal bone? And that is the calcaneus. If you get a stress fracture of the calcaneus, that tends to be intraarticular in about 75% of cases. And stress fractures in the calcaneus, you are typically looking for fracture lines that are perpendicular to the trabecular lines on a radiograph. In general, what are some high-risk locations for stress fractures? I've already mentioned the tensile side of bone, and particularly the tensile side of the femoral neck is at high risk for progressing to a complete or displaced fracture. Transverse patellar fractures are also high risk, whereas a longitudinal patellar fracture is at lower risk, and that is because of the way the tendons on the superior and inferior pole of the patella can pull it apart. Okay. So transverse patellar fracture is more likely to displace. Anterior tibial midshaft fracture is a bad location because, again, that is on the tensile side of the tibia. A fifth metatarsal fracture is at high risk. The fifth metatarsal fractures are also more difficult to heal because of the constant stress placed on them. Talus fracture, high risk. Navicular fracture, high risk. Sesamoid of the great toe fracture, also high risk for progressing onto a displaced fracture. What is the name for lucent bands that traverse bones at right angles to the cortex on a radiograph? Okay, lucent bands traversing bones at right angles to the cortex on a radiograph. And these are looser zones, L-O-O-S-E-R, looser zones. And when you see these, you need to think of insufficiency fractures And these are most commonly associated with osteomalacia or rickets. And the most common location for fractures in the setting of osteoporosis is the spine, then the hip, then the wrist. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you have a very osteoporotic patient, think of the spine compression fractures first, then hip fracture, then wrist fracture. Along with insufficiency fractures, if you see an insufficiency fracture of the soft bone, In a patient with Paget's disease in the femur or tibia, 
what is the term for this? And I'm not sure that this would show up on an exam, but it is a banana fracture. You definitely need to know some about Paget's disease. We can spend a whole episode on this later. But a banana fracture is an insufficiency fracture of the femur or tibia. And on a radiograph or bone scan, these bones will be bowing and they are prone to fracture. And that is a banana fracture. So we are almost complete here. Let's talk about some warning signs for pathologic fractures. Or I should say warning signs that a pathologic fracture is present, meaning that you have underlying malignancy or another bone abnormality. First is an avulsion fracture of the lesser trochanter. I mentioned that previously. If you have any lesion that has greater than 50% of the cortex missing or greater than about 3 centimeters length of the cortex missing, that is a warning sign for pending pathologic fracture. If you have any vertebral lesion that encompasses greater than 50% of the vertebral body, that is at risk for a pathologic fracture. And if you have any lesion within the femoral neck, that can place you at risk for pathologic fracture. Let's review some secondary signs of an ACL injury, and these can include the deep notch sign, bone contusions, and a Sagan fracture. And I remember the Sagan fracture ACL association by telling myself, you are going to need a second ACL if you have a Sagan fracture. Okay, that's kind of cheesy, but it's worked for me. Sagan fracture ACL injury, also the deep notch sign. And that is a finding on a lateral radiograph where you see deepening of the lateral condylopatellar sulcus, and that results from an impaction fracture. And that should make you think that this could be a secondary sign of an ACL injury. And lastly, what do we call an avulsion fracture of the proximal fibula? Okay, small avuls proximal fibular fragment, what is the name for that? And the answer is an arcuate sign. And this is an avulsion at the insertion of the arcuate ligament complex. And commonly this will be the fibular collateral ligament, biceps, femoris, tendon, or both that causes the avulsion. And about 90% of these are associated with a cruciate ligament injury. So the arcuate sign should also make you think of cruciate ligament injury. And more commonly, that would be a PCL injury. So remember, a Sagan fracture is an avulsion fracture from the tibia. And the arcuate sign is an avulsion fracture of the proximal fibula. This concludes my review of fractures for the ABR core examination. I appreciate all the positive feedback that I've had, all the five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts or other podcast directories. Also, if there are topics you would like me to discuss, please let me know on Twitter at RadRevPodcast or send me an email at theradiologyreview at gmail.com. And finally, make sure to download the study guide for fractures for the ABR core exam that is free on my website, www.theradiologyreview.com. Keep up the learning, keep studying hard, and prepare to succeed. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.